It's 19 hours GMT. Hello, good evening to you. Welcome to News 360. It's live my news up here at Tadesawa in Kanda. My name is Alfred Okansi. I am Aisha Yakubu. Top of the bulletin this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint and Piccadilly Biscuits, My Life Insurance. EC suspends indefinitely limited voters' registration exercise slated for June 7 following court decision. Also, law experts express varied views about the refusal of Boko Central MP Mahama Yarga to appear before court on June 4 over tax evasion charges. And police in the Upper West region says investigations are still ongoing following the arrest of a 55-year-old Burkina Faso national spotted with a shotgun in a Catholic church in Hamile. Uh, the head of the banking institutions and supervision at the Bank of Ghana says about 30 directors and shareholders of microfinance facing prosecution for the various roles they played in the collapse of their companies. On the international front, Sudanese security forces attacked pro-democracy protests outside the military headquarters in the capital Khartoum. Bring you details of these and more tonight here on News 360 in the next 60 minutes. Stay with us here. We're live on TV3 Ghana, on Facebook, all across the world on 3news.com and on DSTV channel 279. Our first story this evening, the Electoral Commission has called off the planned limited voter registration exercise slated for June 7. A statement from the Electoral Commission on Monday said the decision stemmed from a pending injunction application seeking to restrain the commission from going ahead with the registration exercise. One Omar Ayuba took the Electoral Commission to court over the exercise seeking an injunction on uh, the exercise, the limited registration exercise to, is to proceed the district assembly elections and referendum. It is unclear how the pending injunction would affect the calendar of the Electoral Commission, which less than six months to conduct the district assembly elections. Now, not much seemed to have changed four years since the June 3 disaster. Wendy Lai made a tour of the major sites affected by the incidents four years ago and filed this report. It's been four years since the June 3 disaster. As a result of that very disaster, over 150 lives were lost. Property West, millions of cities were destroyed in the fire and the flood. Several recommendations were made. Four years on, I will be visiting some of the points that were greatly affected by the disaster. I'm currently at the Asylum Down drain. And this drain is very close to the Paloma Hotel. It's actually behind the Paloma Hotel. But it seems there hasn't really been a change in relation to the disposal of waste. Now, right here, I can see at the edge of the drain, there are several plastic bottles that have been left here. Exactly May 29, 2019, there was a downpour and Circle got flooded. I'm very close to the Providence Insurance Company Limited and this part of the road got flooded. There were several videos on social media and there was one particular one where we saw a man swimming due to the extent of the flooding here. Now, although we can see there's some desilting of the gutter here, it's still a testament of what needs to be done and also tells us that a lot hasn't really changed when it comes to the precautions that we need to take to prevent flooding. The corn 
Sometimes dredging, unsuccessful dredging of the Odo drain is seen by many as one way to deal with the perennial flooding that affects circle and its environment. Year in, year out, this has become a political conversation and the question is, when will we see this happen successfully? the June 3 disaster and this very area where I'm standing is a major reference point in relation to the flood and the fire. Four years on, has life returned to normal? Nancy Kura Nas, a bear to two to three years in one as a Hanuma in the past that across a fashion. Patronage only shot up only two, three years ago. The disaster created a lot of fear and panic, thereby causing the public not to use this stretch. Nothing has actually changed. Uh, I don't think much has been done to do away with the flooding. Just recently, I think there was this race, and uh, still the flooding people are still complaining. Now, the uh, things are not changed because. Yeah, we will see person put water for this place. We will see the water side inside the crowd. People, the people, water for water inside. All those things here, yeah, no good. Well, the Ghana Meteorological Agency has already warned of more rains in the coming days, and that should be the red alert. Work on the Peshi Bridge on the Lateshi Beach Road in Accra is yet to be completed five years after reconstruction began. Frederick Clarence Williams reports motorists continue to use a temporary Bailey Bridge owing to the stalled project. The Peshi Bridge links Accra and Tema on the Eastern Corridor. The road remains the only alternative route between Accra and Tema after the motorway. Road engineers had warned the bridge could cave in if immediate action was not taken. Although the bridge appears strong from afar, a closer look reveals several cracks. The obviously weak structure forced a closure of the bridge to traffic in October 2014 for major rehabilitation work after TV3's reportage. Maintenance works on the bridge started and was expected to be completed in 2015, but contractors missed the deadline. When the news team visited the area to ascertain progress of work, there was no sign of completion. Even though some works have been done on one lane of the bridge, the project has been abandoned. Weeds have started growing on them. Motorists are currently using a temporary Bailey Bridge due to the closure of the main bridge. The temporary Bailey Bridge, also currently in use, has started developing cracks, making driving dangerous. The other lane of the bridge has deteriorated further. Cracks on strategic support positions are also eating deeper. Structural cracks have become visible here as well. A clear warning that paling is not far off. Now more than ever, disaster looms. A contract was awarded in 2014 with the intention of completing the project within three months. But here we are, five years on, the project is still not completed. Frederick Clarence Williams, TV3, Peshi Bridge, Accra. Now, police in the Upper West region have commenced investigations into the 55-year-old Bokinabo who was arrested with a shotgun in a Catholic church in Hamile in the Upper West region. The man, who was said to have suspiciously entered the church during a first mass service on Sunday, June 2, triggered the action to interrogate him leading to his arrest. Foreign pistol loaded with a nine cartridge, with, loaded with nine cartridges of live ammunition, which he claimed he acquired lawfully in Burkina Faso. The Upper West Regional Police have since commenced investigations into the matter to ascertain the motive for handling the weapon in the place of worship. Some worshippers told TV3 that the man came to the church on a bicycle but started behaving strangely which created suspicion among church members there has been a recent attack on some churches in sub region 
Therefore, the contact, conduct of the gunman puts fear in the worshippers, including some Ghanaians. Though security has been strengthened in the area, but Hamile has a lot of unapproved routes in Burkina Faso, which is a major concern to national security. Well, let's step a bit further on this. Uh, Richard Kumado is a fraud and security consultant. He joins me on the telephone. Mr. Kumado, good evening to you. Thank you for your time this evening. Clearly, this is the spillover effect after that attack in Burkina Faso. But could, have we put enough measures in place to check some of these things which are clearly expected after that incident? Now, to the extent that a guy could come into our country with a gun and find himself in a church, it means that the alert that has been issued earlier is true, and this is the practicality of it. Uh, we have porous borders across all our country. We have raised this issue, spoke about it publicly and privately. Uh, it is a wake-up call for everybody, for the state itself to be able to provide the security agencies with the, uh, with the strategic training and with the appropriate tools and the materials that we need to patrol all our borders. It's also a time to thank the church people for being observant and alert in spotting a man in their means with a gun. Then, of course, the gun is lancing, so we'll be waiting for the police to do a very good job. They have acted proactively and swiftly in this matter, and we are commending them. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, you cannot also take away the vigilance of the people in the church who were able to identify this man and alerted the police. But you hit the point right there on the issues with our porous borders. What do we do? Because clearly, the concentration is on the major entry point and not those porous areas which they can also go through. We have done an extensive work across the north. I came back from the north about last week as part of the risk assessment. Uh, the various points, like Hamlet is a major entry point, the Boko side is a major entry point, uh, the Yenji, Sabo, Batri, Pony side is a major, Aflau is a major. We have we have documented these things. Governments and for governments have had access to some of these documents. It is a wake-up call for the state to do something about it. We must be seen as a proactive people in order not to be reacting after the harm has been caused. We have a gun in our church, and whether the gun is registered or not, the state must take a central position. The security agencies must be very proactive. Uh, we live in a country where you don't have a single two free line uh, for alertness and for the first responders to get to the scene. In preventing such issues, the first responders and the frontliners must be moving quickly. And we don't want to jam up the system where lines are not working and people don't have credit on their phones to make that call. Once the call is made, we must be moving very fast. Otherwise, the on towards something will happen. The cash rates will be very high. Clearly, I mean, it's an integrated security system. Uh, that's what you're proposing. But, I mean, what, what could be the worst that could happen? I'm asking this because, just as you said, this is the first time you are raising these issues. It's not been tackled. So what could happen for us to really want to wake up? You, you, know, you know what we do in this country. We tend to react more than responding. And today, if that thing has gone off at the church, God forbid, the security infrastructure there would have changed. The security perimeter there would have changed. And we must not wait for some evil things to happen before we begin to take proactive steps. The system has been designed in such a way that it needs enhancement and improvement. Recruit the right people, give them the right training, provide the right equipment for them, and they will do their job. You remember when this country, years back, and we were told that right. a guy went to church to kill a city president. True. After that one, nothing has been heard. We need benchmarks. Otherwise, the first line of investigators will have a little bit of difficulty in raveling some of these issues. And even though we are talking about integrated security approaches and all that, the later we have, let's preserve it, enhance it, and be more creative about it. Then we will put our nation to safety. Mr. Kumado, I want to thank you for your time this evening. Grateful. You, uh, Richard Kumado is a fraud and security consultant. So it's an issue mm -hmm. that really uh, must uh, be attended to very, very swiftly. Yeah. Yes, because of the porous nature of mm -hmm. our borders. And this is not the first time. We know the porous nature of our borders, right. um, Aisha. And then it's something that we've talked about over the period. Mm -hmm. And so you know that with what has happened in Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. 
the spillover effects will clearly, you know, come in. We're expecting that a lot of people will move in from Burkina mm -hmm. Faso into Ghana as a result of this. So let, let's see hopefully, how... Yes, hopefully this uh, is good. The security good. agencies will move in to address this. But remember, you're still live here on News 360. We're live on DSTV Channel 279, on TV3 Ghana, on Facebook. Stay with us. We're back with some more. Thanks for staying with us. Now, government says it is revising the existing cybersecurity policy and strategy to be responsive to current challenges to meet international standards and best practices. As a first step, the National Cybersecurity and the Interception Bill will be introduced to Parliament this year towards addressing legislative gap. Ghana has not had a major cyber attack except hackings of government websites as worrying as the 2016 Liberian attack was, government of Ghana sees a potential threat. The central bank, as recent as 2018, raised concerns on a possible threat of cyber attacks in the financial sector, summed up as concerns. These issues are gaining strength from the Ministry of Communication. The Cyber Security Center is pushing MPs to apprise themselves on the dangers as they await regulations. Somebody might sit in Cote d'Ivoire or Burkina and hack into our system and get information so that they can, you know, do whatever they want to do. So by doing this, we'll be able to identify or when they are caught, there's a legality backing them to prosecute the person. So I think in a broad way, it's going to help all spheres of cyber security. A three-day retreat to build the capacity of members of the select committee in the area of cyber security and to review the draft cyber security legislations, cyber security bill and the interception bill and the revised national cyber security policy and strategy has begun. The introduction of the interception bill is expected to address the current challenges faced by law enforcement and security agencies while ensuring that Ghana meets its international obligations as a state party to the Budapest Convention. We also have a major problem with inadequate human resources and IT skills development in the area of cybersecurity due to the fact that very few people are equipped to handle this menace effectively. The legislations are aimed at establishing a cybersecurity authority, providing a legal framework to effectively conduct cyber-related activities in the interest of the public and protecting critical national information infrastructure of the country. Now, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has lauded the two traditional leaders in Saboba and Chirponi districts for taking steps to resolve the communal conflict. Dr. Baumia said government is ready to meet with the two parties to seek amicable resolution of the conflict in the area. Here's a report by Zubaida Ismail. The delegation first called on the paramount chief of Saboba, Obori John Bowen Martyr, where the vice president was briefed about the planned meeting between Konkumba and the Anofo leaderships. The vice president next moved to the community center at Chiripone, where he called on all the two ethnic groups to cease fire. From their point of view, they want the fighting to stop. This is the word of the paramount chief of, of uh, Saboba. And the same thing was repeated by the president of Koya. And they said that he wants to have a meeting from the, with the, between them and the Cherponi Traditional Council, Your Majesty, with yourself and your chiefs, so that you can really cement the peace. Dr. Baumia again revealed that the presidency will be meeting the two traditional leadership to foster unity and coexistence. Calm has meanwhile returned to the center of the communal conflict, Chirpone, following the bipartisan delegation visit on Friday, May 24, led by the Defense Minister Dominic Nituo. You're watching News 360. Alfred is standing by with Business News. Business News segment is brought to you by MTN 4G Plus, Universal Merchant Bank, West Hills Estates, Eden Heights, Lunat from Tobinko.
well for telling us what's happening in the world of business. Fantastic, uh, Aisha, thank you. Let's get into the world of business now. And two major unions have proposed to the management of the collapsed microfinance institutions to petition the Bank of Ghana to review its decision. So the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union and the Ghana National Association of Teachers, that's NAT, actually praised the Bank of Ghana for this swift action. But the general secretaries of the two unions who spoke exclusively to our correspondent in Elopoko want the unions to act. The General Secretary of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU, was elated about the decision of the Bank of Ghana. Nevertheless, he underscored the immeasurable role of microfinance institutions. He believes most of them lack the capacity to run. So when Kote again said, the BOG should have considered the strength of each institution and operations before withdrawing their licenses. Rather, we expect that the affected microfinance companies to rather make an appeal and address their individual situation and maybe do some declaration and prove beyond all reasonable doubt that if you are given the opportunity, they should be able to stand on their feet. Because come to think of it, over 100 of them are also still in existence operating without problems. So it isn't that it is all microfinances in the economy that have been closed. Those that have been closed obviously have challenges. So they should assess the degree of their challenge and believe that if we are giving a good opportunity, we should be able to manage ourselves. He again expressed concern about the future workers who may lose their job. First place, I'll use this your medium to say that ICU have been saying over the years that the most safest place you can work is where there's a union. Those workers there who don't have a union, at this point, it's like um, they've lost everything, okay? Because if, if such a closure as that is trying to paint the picture that these microfinances are bankrupt, then that is your end. The General Secretary of the National Association of Teachers, NAT, lauded BOG for the prompt action. He blamed management and microfinance institutions for failing to uphold corporate governance. I mean, that is a basic thing. You see, you all have to help all of us as Ghanaians to ensure that we do the right things. I mean, a lot of people set up fraudulent businesses and, I mean, just cashing on the ignorance of our people. So if things are being done rightly, why don't we all support it? He again suggested a roadmap to mitigate the pain of those laid off. Of Ghana to do their job. People take licenses to do specific things. If you flout the laws, the laws must deal with you. If it has to come with job losses, well, it's unfortunate. But I cannot say that let's sacrifice job losses and encourage impunity. The country cannot develop going that way. All right, let's just stay a bit further with the Bank of Ghana because there was an earlier statement of the Bank of Ghana finding Barclays Bank for uh, over 4.58 million Ghana cities over frivolous interbank codes. Well, the Barclays Bank has responded to this statement just coming through and they say it is in they are in talks with the Bank of Ghana as regards reports it has been fined by the regulator for making frivolous quotes on the Ghana interbank foreign exchange market. Bank of Ghana has sanctioned Barclays Bank of Ghana over what it described as a violation of the Ghana interbank forex market conduct rules. The Bank of Ghana in a statement earlier uh, said the bank has been fined an amount of 4.57 million Ghana cities for making frivolous quotes on Ghana's interbank foreign exchange market. The statement added that the Bank of Ghana is committed to ensuring sanity, transparency and promoting best practices that serve the, and also to develop and dipping the forex market in Ghana. Well, that's a statement coming from Barclays Bank Ghana. But MTN Ghana has launched its modern advanced wireless internet router, Tebonet. Now, Tebonet, which is suitable for home or office use, provides instant high-speed internet for up to 32 users at the same time. MTN Tebonet is now the fastest internet in Ghana, serving up to 300 megabits per second. The device, which is a modern technology router, amplifies the network signal, giving you consistent 4G, which is not limited by location. The launch brought together management of the company, stakeholders, and a host of MTN subscribers. The device, which was piloted in February this year, has sold over 12,000 units already. With as low as 300 cities, 
one can purchase the device and enjoy high-speed internet for up to 32 users at the same time. CEO of MTN Ghana, Salom Adadevo, touts the TurboNet as a revolution in Ghana's digital space. For us at MTN, we believe every Ghanaian deserves the benefits of a modern connected life. And instead of just talking about it, instead of just talking about it, we have chosen to do something about it by revolutionizing the high-speed home broadband industry through the MTN Turbonet solution. Deputy Communications Minister George Anda commended the company for the innovation and acknowledged the move as a boost to Ghana's digitization drive. Increased broadband penetration, which is reliable, affordable, and accessible nationwide, will certainly propel Ghana's participation in the fourth industrial revolution. It will also facilitate the modernization of government processes in service delivery, even as we work towards building our digital economy and establish Ghana as a leader in ICT innovations in sub-Saharan Africa by 2023. Testimonies by some customers revealed how convenient and reliable the device was and a boost to their businesses and everyday life. Patrons who had their flyers beneath their seats represented TurboNet, Quasi TV boxes and cameras. You can purchase bundles from a range of data plans using the short code star 5057 hash or MTN mobile money star 170 hash. Well, that's it for the business news this evening here on News 360. Remember, you can also log on to 3news.com for some more business news. Stay with us. We're back with some more news. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Theo Inyan. Now, we start with the Black Stars because they have begun training in Abu Dhabi in preparation for the African Cup of Nations. Coach Chris Yapi and his captain, um, Andrea Yu, and Coach Asamoah were all pictured in high spirits as training went ahead this afternoon. Ghana scheduled to play two pre tournament friendlies against Namibia and South Africa in the Gulf country. His Excellency, um, well, the Ramadan, who was with some staff of uh, the embassy, encouraged the players to uh, make the nation proud by ending a 37-year wait for continental success, having won their last title in 1982. The Black Stars have been pulled alongside Benin, Guinea-Bissau and Cameroon in Group F at the tournament. Now, Ghana have failed to win the African Cup of Nations, that's the AFCON, since 1982, despite having appeared in the final on three occasions after they conquered the continent in Libya. And James Kasiapia is also optimistic that Black Star's ability to clinch the 2019 African Cup of Nations is not far from fetched. I believe that no one wants you know, to win the AFCON more than me. You know, being the coach, and um, every competition that you know you attend, the vision is to try and win it. And I think it applies to every single coach who is coming for the competition. Uh, no coach will go to a competition and say, oh, "Okay, I want to go and be the last team." You know, but Ghana, as we all know, uh, every competition for some years now, been getting to the uh, at least the quarterfinals. You know, so uh, my ambition now is to try and win the cup for, for our nation. Because it's been years since we won it. And uh, as a coach now, uh, that is my priority. What do you say to those people who say that lately, whether it's Asamoah John, whether it's Dede, whether it's Jordan, whether it's Philip, our players are just not playing at the level mm. required to be able to win a tournament. Yeah, automatically you get worried, you know, if most of your players are inactive. But um, saying that, you know, these players are the best that we have. Talking about African Cup of Nations, sometimes, and even recent times have shown that, you know, big names or big teams does not count that much. Because um, 
when you're an underdog, that's where you can surprise everyone. Now let's do some local football and normalization committee of the Ghana Football Association is insisting that Asante Kotoko honor the uh, NC special competition fixture game against Hearts of Folk at the Crossball Stadium. The Kumasi Bay side finished bottom in zone A of tier one of the competition and are therefore expected to play eternal rivals Hearts of Folk. But there has been confusion over the venue, Kotoko Field playing in Accra will be favorable for Hearts and therefore will not honor the game. But the FA, in a strongly worded document, has stated clearly that the game will remain at the Accra Sports Stadium and will be played on June 16, 2018. That'll be all for the sports here on News 360 with me, Thierry Vignan. Welcome back in some more stories. Savako PPS Ghana Limited has attributed its success over the past 20 years to its dynamic, research-driven and experienced team in the industrial consumable sector. At a ceremony to market 20th anniversary and commissioning of a new office in Tema, the company expressed its resolve to meet its customers' industrial needs across the supply chain. Zavago PPS Ghana Limited is a leading provider of high-quality industrial products, technical services and innovative solutions to industries in West Africa. The company has grown steadily to become a leading supplier of industrial consumables and services in the mining, quarry, construction, manufacturing, oil, gas, marine, power, water and telecom sector in West Africa. The new Sevaku building was commissioned by the chairman of the Council of States, the president of Full Gospel International, and the chairman of the board of Sevaku PPS Ghana. For a business to grow, you have to understand the needs of your customers. Once you understand the needs of your customers and your customers are satisfied, the customers will then intend to refer you to other people. And then, you know, gradually, patronage of their product will be increased. Well, for young coming entrepreneurs, I'll take my case as an example. It's all about service. These days, people are quick to make money, but people are not quick to go through the processes of being molded to be able to become very good entrepreneurs. So we have to be patient, learn our trade with skill, understanding, and conviction of, of, of purpose. Director and shareholder of the company, Paul Jones, highlighted the company's growth over the past 20 years. And my business partner in the UK, Andrew, back in 1998, uh, having already been working in Ghana since about the uh, early 90s, um, we saw an opportunity here uh, for a mining supply business. So we uh, joined forces with Rudolph and decided to uh, take the business forward and invest in the country. Um, and it's accumulated in, in today's big event, so yeah. Well, as we expressed today, we, we, we've already opened up in Burkina Faso. We're looking at the rest of the West African market. We've got a whole portfolio of new products that we're about to take on board and to sort of start promoting to the West African region. So the times ahead are very exciting. We've got a lot on our plate. We're looking forward to, to entering into a manufacturing agreement with certain people here. So we will become not only a distributor and supplier of products, but a manufacturer of certain engineering products here in country. Sevaco PPS Ghana Limited operates across the entire West Africa region, out of strategic hubs in Ghana, Burkina Faso, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. It markets quality products from the world's leading industrial brands more than any other supplier in the sub region. Let's get into the world of entertainment with some exciting moments of talent. Seven year old poet Nakeat Dramani Sam was on Sunday night a judge winner of Talented Kids Season 10. Two rounds of thrilling renditions eloquently delivered on environmental sustainability and the need to uphold the value and dignity of human rights won the class three pupil the ultimate. Also, Rai has been walking us through how Nakiat ruled the kids. The National Theatre welcomed a full house of expectant crowd. <laughs> Finalists equally appeared perfectly poised to make a difference. The first round of performance was hard fought.
but it was young dancehall acts from a shy man Skonzi GH, keyboardist Prince Ochre, saxophonist Nene Kojo, and eloquent poet Nakiat who stood out. There are two spots now. The first one will be taken by Nakiat. The amazing poet fascinated patrons and judges with an awesome performance on the need to protect the environment, preaching cleanliness and afforestation. The performance also charged duty bearers to take action to rid the environment of plastic waste. Exuding confidence, the class three pupil and poster girl for determination made a big difference in the second stage of the competition. Posing as a child rights advocate, the prodigy condemned all forms of abuse against children, urging all to uphold the value and dignity of human rights. At this stage, the young poet had earned massive praises and applause for her mind-blowing performances. It therefore came as no surprise when she was announced winner. Your winner, Nakia! Nakia took home a cash prize of 10,000 Ghana cities, a 15,000 Ghana cities worth educational fund, an educational scholarship, a fully paid trip abroad sponsored by British Columbia College, among others. I feel very happy. Thank you, TV3. God bless you. We've been doing by the mother of seven-year-old Nakia Dramani, winner of Talented Kids, and she's super excited. Her daughter has won this competition. She described Nakia as a special gift from God. In the first place, I give glory to the Almighty God. I'm very privileged to have a daughter like Nakiat. I thank everybody, Ghanaians, those I know and those I don't know. I'm so happy. In fact, I don't know how to express my happiness. To me, she's more than talented. It's a special gift. Multi-talented instrumentalist Nene Kojo plays second with Obwasi-based keyboardist Prince Ochre coming third. Amazing. It was very, very interesting Lovely. watching all the kids mm -hmm. last night. Absolutely. I had a swell time. You know, they brought their best. You know, they gave it all. And, and it was clear, you know. And what I'm even more excited about is, you know, this, this platform mm -hmm. that TV3 has given to these children to unearth their talent. Okay, so their talent. I did not been for talented kids. I don't know where these would have been. But I want to say, Thank you as always for staying with us over the last 60 minutes. My name is Alfred Okansi. I'm Aisha Yakub. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good evening.